So um, Friday night, we've been, the, the Lord has been like moving in a very significant way on Friday nights. And um, I just wanted her to share a quick testimony, quickly, because I know the preach is on you. So you can sh- quickly, <laughs> quickly share. Mm. Okay, God bless you guys. Good morning. See, there you go. Thank you. Absolutely. Good job. Good job there. All right, so I've Shabbat. been going through a couple of things with work. And um, they have Shabbat. been a great obstacle for me to even grow spiritually. Shabbat. I had moments where I see patients and I was just like, I would burn inside for me to go and speak to them, to go and preach about the gospel and just share the love of Christ to them. But they would hold me back. And there was so much pressure in the atmosphere. There was not peace. And there was just a spirit like of the Antichrist because they didn't want me to speak of God. And I just felt oppressed. And I had so many issues and I felt anxiety and even moments of depression. I felt like I would bring that home sometimes. And I was just asking God, just just let me finish with the old and take me into the new. And let me just grow in you spiritually and let my eyes open and the desire in my heart for you to just Yeah, Friday grow. night. Friday night. Yeah, Friday night. We're talking about Friday night. <laughs> so, sorry. So yeah, just yeah. going to Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then. Yeah, yeah. She's getting started. Up. I might have to sit down soon if I don't. No, 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 no. I mean, I'll finish. On, I'll finish. <laughs> so then um, the song Waymaker started coming up. Friday and night? Friday. Yeah. And then pastor started praying for me at Shabbat. first and I just felt like I, I wanted to I wanted the spirit to break me, you know, to just release all the stuff that have been have been in me. But there was still something holding holding me back. So then this song came up and Sarah and Pastor Carl came and prayed on both sides. And he started saying the same exact words I asked God. Just let release the old and let me begin with the new. And those were the exact words. The old out with the old and in with the new and i just felt so many things coming out of me i was able to forgive those people and i just felt like something like god was taking everything out from the roots and as soon as he started saying people have tried to put you down as well as sarah and he was like you know there's chains breaking there's chains falling and as soon as he said those words chain breaker started coming up in the song so it was just like confirmation and confirmation and confirmation and I felt so released and I feel so much peace and I felt like I could see them and just love on them Hallelujah. and forgive them. Stretch your hand everybody and we just declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord that you that you finish what you start. In the name of Jesus Y'all stretch your hand. Y'all in faith? Are you stretching your hand? Right there. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, go soak in your chair. I don't want you to be laying up here all certain. It's going to happen. Though. Bless you. Give her a big God bless you. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right here, there's normally my Bible in my tablet yeah and it's over here people just abandoned me I feel I need her to pray for me now the spirit of the antichrist is coming stolen my bible <clears throat> hallelujah you guys doing good that worship was pretty good right yeah pretty good yeah that was pretty good yeah you know just God was here you know let's not make too big a deal out of it you know it's God, right? Psh, hallelujah, <clears throat> hallelujah. That's pretty good. I'm, 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 I'm having a good time. <clears throat> I got, a, I got a word for you today. Uh, that Jesus, Jesus came to carry the heavy load. Jesus came to do all the heavy lifting in your relationship with God. He came to do all the heavy lifting in your relationship with the world and with other people. Jesus actually came to bring peace. Amen. And that's a word for you today, and that's what the Lord, <clears throat> and that's what the Lord wants me to tell you that He actually came to bring the peace. He came to carry the heavy load. And I have been convicted recently <clears throat> that uh, I often, you know, I, I have experiences with God, and uh, I, I'm the kind of person where, like, I just want the facts. I just want the facts. I just want the bottom line. Like, people want to tell me long stories. I'm like, can you just? I don't know if you noticed. I'm like, can we just get to the point of the story? Can we just? And so my wife doesn't like to watch movies with me because I like to watch movies and fast forward through like the slow parts. Like I don't got time for all that. Like 
people get emotional and want to look at each other. I'm like, yeah, you're looking at each other. Come on, let's just fast forward. Let's just, let's just move it along a little bit. And so I like to, like, my wife said, oh, you watched that movie? I'm like, yeah, I found, you know, it was about 45 minutes long. It's like 45 minutes? That's about all it really took. All right, so I like to just, I like to just get, to the, I get to the point. And so a lot of times I'll have encounters with God or I'll have spiritual encounters and uh, the Lord will tell me something or illuminate scripture for me. And I get in the pulpit and I share with you what I got. And the Lord has convicted me that I didn't tell you that I have not shared how I got it um, because not, I not only need to show you what I got, but I need to show you where I found it so that you know where to go look for it. Does this make sense? <clears throat> Not to glorify any person or their gift. That is the absolute wrong thing to do. But to show you how some gifts operate. So you say, oh, wait a minute. That operates in me too. That's what I can look for. And so um, the Lord has convicted me of that. And he's challenged me. And he's brought it not only by his spirit, but some of the leaders of the church um, <clears throat> in our meeting. They're like, listen, I'm like you got to share some of the backstory and some of the stuff. I'm like, all right. So I'm going to do that today. Um, and uh, we're just going to see more of that in the weeks to come. Amen. Uh, and I'm doing that, uh, basically I'm expecting this to happen in your life. Can you turn him down one touch, uh, Mr. Salman? <clears throat> and so I'm just expecting an activation in your life, amen? So uh, we're working our way through the book of Mark. Well, actually, not really. We're working through what are five stories about Jesus. We shared one uh, on Easter, and now we're sharing four stories. Because five minus Easter is four. <laughs> that was a joke, I appreciate that, but... Um, it's going to be a rough crowd today, Mike. I, mean, I might need you when you bring the band back, maybe. I don't know. <clears throat> we're in our uh, third story. Next week, we're going to share our fourth. And then Pentecost Sunday, we're expecting God to come in and rock some lives. Amen? Hey. So if you're going to bring your baggage to church, that's the week you want to bring it. <laughs> church isn't where we get cute, right? That's where we're cute. Here is where we get where we touch God so we can take it out there, right? Like... Too many people try to be cute in church. Don't make any sense. Don't make any sense. Like, don't be like, 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 it's like when you go to college, like in the beginning, and there's people there who want to learn something, and then there's some people who are in 13th grade. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And the people in 13th grade wasting their tuition think they're cool. And you're like, you understand you're blowing your finances and your future. Like, I don't know, maybe in middle school that was cool, but now you're just an idiot, right? Like, like. It's hard to go back to college when you're 27 or 37, right? But when you're 21 and you're blowing your opportunity, that's just dumb, right? And so here, we don't want to blow our opportunity to touch God. So we can look cute to other people who are, you know, in 13th grade spiritually. <clears throat> <clears throat> so here we are in Mark chapter 2, and I'm expecting impartation today, amen? All right, Mark chapter 2, uh, let's read it with me if you would. We're going to start in verse 23. And pull out your Bible. <clears throat> and it happened. This is a story about Jesus. And it happened, Shabbat. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need? And he and his companions became hungry. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? Amen. Give it up for Mikey if you would. Now, I've talked about this extensively, but if you look at your Bible, in many Bibles today, at the beginning of that story, there'll be something in it that isn't actually in the Bible. And it says, and, and, and above this, and it says it in my Bible, it says, questions about the Sabbath. Um, you know, there, there's, um, there's a whole bunch of different translations of the Bible out there. Right? There's a bunch of them. Uh, and all of the Bible translations are translated for slightly different reasons. They want to make it either more clear or more complex. Some people write versions of the Bible because they have an agenda they're trying to come across. But what's really important in picking out your Bible is you want to use a Bible that actually reflects the words that were actually written in the earliest Greek manuscripts. Does that make sense? So the New Testament was written in mostly, almost entirely in Greek. Uh, and um, we found the oldest uh, manuscripts, they, they get those, uh, these, 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 they're just parchments 
uh, and they translate them into whatever language you might like. And what's funny is what we learn from the Bible in English sometimes isn't actually what it says in Greek because there isn't an English word for the Greek word. Does that make sense? And so we actually, watch this, have to actually study to know what the Bible says. So it's, a, it's a radical concept these days. Um, and we might actually have to ask Jesus what it is we're supposed to be learning from this. However, there are translations of the Bible out there. They're not actually translations. They're called paraphrases. And what they do is they basically tell you, uh, here's a Bible. It's so complex. We're going to let you know what it basically says. And there's a translation out there today that's very, very popular that adds things to the Bible that aren't actually in the Greek at all, like whole sentences. And it actually changes the meanings of some of the stories. And, and I actually own a copy, and I read it, and I find it encouraging, but it's not actually reading the Bible. It's like reading about the Bible. It's like reading a commentary. Does that make sense? And it's okay to read about the Bible, but it's wrong to read about the Bible and think you're reading the Bible. All right? I use the New American Standard Bible. There's a whole bunch of different translations that are great. Not as good as that one. But, um, <laughs> but it's more difficult to, to read. We don't give it out in the jail. Uh, we give out the New International Version, don't we, in prison, uh, in jail, because it's just easier to read. And I don't know maybe what that says, what we think about prisoners. But... Um, it, that's just what we use because it's a little easier to read. Uh, but in any translation of the Bible, any, any manuscript you look at, questions about the Sabbath is not in there. That was my whole point in that rant. It's not in there. <clears throat> that's what happened. Some day, one day some guy decided, you know what, I'm going to make it easier for other people to know what the Bible's about. I'm going to tell them what they're about to read. And so before the story, they put questions about the Sabbath. The only problem is that's not what the story is about at all. And if you follow that, you're going to miss what Jesus is actually trying to teach you in this lesson. Amen? And I want to learn from Jesus. I don't want to learn from some guy who thought I wasn't smart enough to hear from God and find out what this is about. Really? So what, what this really is about here as we read this section of Scripture, what, what, what it's, it's the real question that it asks is not about Sabbath, but the real question is, what does it mean to be a follower of God? What does it mean to be a follower of God? As you grow in Christ, and hopefully you all, if you've not met Jesus, today is the day. Congratulations. Today is your new birthday. Amen? Today, I don't, I feel like someone could be more excited about that than that. <clears throat> today is the day. It's so awesome that today is the day of salvation. <clears throat> you get to a place in your walk, at some point you're going to have to come to the question, what does it mean to be a follower of of God. And religion has an answer for you. Religion says, just follow these rules and you'll be okay. When you meet people who are completely um, removed from God, they say like, you know, I don't, I don't believe in religion. I don't, I, don't, I don't follow any organized religion. Organized religion is bad. And then what they'll do always, invariably, they'll tell you the rules that they've come up with, that they've kept, which make them right with God. They've invented their own, hear this, religion. I don't believe in organized religion. No, you believe in disorganized religion, apparently, because that don't make any sense what you just said, right? You'll say, oh, do you believe in Christ? Ah, I'm spiritual. I just, I just believe that you have to be nice to people, and then the cosmic thing that you just made up pays off. Is that, is that how it works? And that would make sense, you know, like if you created everything, but you didn't, and so it doesn't really work that way. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you talked to me like, I just, you know, I never killed anybody, and, I, and I'm a good person? I'm like, <clears throat> oh, is that, that, those are the rules, those are the rules. Like you don't kill anybody, and you're a good person. Well, here's the problem you have now. Who's a good person? How good is good enough? What is good? Well, that's a difficult road to slide down. And this is what the Jews were wrestling with in the many, many years in between when the last time they heard God speak and the time of Jesus. What is good enough? And let me tell you this. For religion, you're never good enough. You are never good enough for religion. Religion will let you know time and time again, whatever you're doing is not enough. You feel good about your relationship with God? Too bad. It's not enough. What does it mean to be a follower of God? And we talked about this last week or, or week before that often the first person who disciples us gives us the lens that we view Scripture through. And we don't actually take the time or effort to examine where did I get this lens and is this actually what God wants me to view the scriptures through? Is this actually the lens? Like, like there are, there are um, theological debates happening right now. And people, uh, uh, they don't wrestle with, did God bring this or did man bring it? There's these theological debates about 
about abortion. There's theological debates about women in ministry. There's theological debates about marriage. There's theological debates about tongues. There's theological debates about encounters. There's theological debates about even the role of the Bible. And people, generally, their answer is whatever the first lens they were given, not I encountered God, I found it in the scripture, and this is the truth. Does this make sense? I want you to encounter God and get the truth. That's our goal. You got you to know what truth is, and you need to follow it. Now, I can answer all those questions for you because I already have them answered. But it'd be better if you get some for yourself. Amen? <clears throat> you can get all those right and still not be right with God, though. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know who that was for. It's not even in my message, but I hope you got something out of that. So if you were to talk to a Jew today, they don't talk about the Sabbath. They talk about the Shabbat. They say Shabbat Shalom, right? Shabbat. It's, you know, they say, happy Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, peace on the Sabbath, right? They have Shabbat services, right? So Sabbath is like another way of saying this same word. And, and it comes from the days when they were traveling through the desert. If you remember, the, the Jews were traveling through the desert looking for the promised land. And there was this flaky stuff on the ground. We like to think that there were loaves of Wonder Bread out there that the Lord just sent loaves of bread. And that's not how it worked. It was actually flaky stuff. And the Bible didn't actually tell us how they used it, but we know they ate it. Right? And this was, the, this was the manna from heaven. And uh, one day a bunch of ravens showed up dead. Now, I'd be like, if you can just send bread, why can't you just send, like, meat? Why do I have to, you know, rip out feathers? There should be steaks, right? Like, why couldn't you just send steaks? That would be good. Why ravens? Ravens. You figure if there was a million people wandering, how many dead ravens were there that people were excited about the dead birds? Can you imagine being waist deep in dead ravens? But they were happy about it. I, that's not even in my message. I just don't even know why I'm talking about that. It's, it's quail, actually. There was quail everywhere. I said ravens, but it was quail. <clears throat> and anyway, so one day, one day they got a double portion. They got two days worth of food, and they held it. And, and Moses said, listen, collect two days, and the next day there isn't going to be any. And the next day there was no food on the ground. And God said, hey, or through Moses, hey, listen, so here's what's going to happen. You're going to have five days worth of food. Then one day you're going to get a double portion, and the next day you're going to rest. You're not going to go collect it because you're going to keep this Shabbat, this Sabbath day. You're going to keep it holy, right? That's in Exodus 16, right? And so in Exodus 20, if we were to go forward a little bit more, uh, Moses, if you remember, came down the second time from the mountain with two tablets. Uh, first time he got mad and he broke them. He had a rage issue. Uh, and then uh, he came back down with some new tablets. And, uh, on, and we say there's the Ten Commandments, but really it's just a, a dialogue from God. And depending on how you count them, it's either the third or the fourth commandment said to remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy was the commandment. And the Pharisees, have you noticed, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were always around. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed you can't find Jesus without finding the Pharisees? Like, they're always following him around. Like, they're, like, they can't get enough of this guy. They're questioning him, but they can't get enough. I'd just be like, why don't you just buy my album? I mean, like, they, like just take a picture, buy some of my clothes. Now, today, he would have a T-shirt line, because that's what you do. Once you get a following today, you start producing T-shirts, right? Like, that's what they do. And so he would be selling T-shirts. But uh, back then, they were always around. And the Pharisees were constantly questioning Jesus. Now, there are preachers I don't like. Can I just say that out loud? I'm like, now, if you're preaching Christ, we're on the same team. If you're preaching, I mean, in crazy churches, people get saved. Can anybody say amen to that? Even this one, right? Like, and so Jesus will move through any ministry. Right? Like, He'll move through it. If you're seeking God, he, like he says, a, a smoldering wick you will not extinguish. Right? So if you're looking for God, you're going to find him. It doesn't mean everything around you is biblical. Right? But the Pharisees, they were like, like, but these people I don't like, I don't follow them. I don't follow them on social media. I don't listen to their messages. I don't preach against them. I just don't follow them. But these Pharisees, they could not get enough of Jesus. <laughs> Everywhere he was, there they were. Now, here's the difference between, see, I am being transformed into the likeness of Christ. It has not happened yet. Because if they were at my house, I'd have kicked them out a long time ago. <clears throat> like I had some of them when I started the church, they're not here anymore. <clears throat> they were politely uninvited. Is that wrong? I mean, like if you're having a barbecue and you're serving all the food, who do you want to go show up? Your haters or the people you actually want to hang out with? 
Is it just me? I'm like, why are you here? Why are you here? But they were always around Jesus because Jesus was always trying to reach people, even the Pharisees. And so <clears throat> here's where it comes down to. Here's the big rub in verse uh, 24. Excuse me. <clears throat> So the Pharisees in Mark 2, 24, he says, they say this, the Pharisees were saying to Jesus, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? <clears throat> the Pharisees in all their self-righteousness, and this is what religion gives you, self-righteousness. This is what you get from the lost people. Do you follow Jesus? No, I don't. I just believe that. And then they tell you about their self-righteousness. I have determined that I am righteous according to my rules. That's what you get from them. Go evangelize. Go talk to some lost people, and this is what you'll hear. Are you a follower of Christ? Oh, I just believe this, that, and that. Oh, you've declared yourself righteous. That's amazing. Have you created a heaven and a hell? Because that's going to be really important pretty soon. Because if you haven't, you might want to find out the one who made it, what he calls righteous, right? Like, that, that'd be pretty important. Right? And he called faith in Jesus Christ righteousness. <clears throat> so here is the, here's the rub. Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, as we talked about before, Mark was the first gospel written. Mark was written mostly to the Romans, right? The non-Jews. It was written to the Romans to kind of tell them about the story of Jesus. Matthew was written later, and much of Mark is found in Matthew. And it's widely believed that though Matthew uh, was a disciple of Peter, and he got much of the embellishments from Peter, uh, a lot of the framework for Matthew comes from Mark. That's why you get the stories a little different in the different Gospels. It's not because some of them are wrong and the Bible's confused. It's no, because some people had different emphasis in their writing than other people. Does that make sense? And so Mark was writing to the Romans. Matthew was writing to the Jews, and they both talk about this story. They talk about it a little bit differently, though. So Mark was not really trying to talk about how Jesus uh, within the law operated, whereas Matthew was trying to talk more about the history of the Israel and Judaism and all that. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So we see, <clears throat> excuse me, we see as, 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 as they both are talking about, they say that Jesus, just like David, is a king. They both talk about how, uh, how King David ate the showbread. And King David ate the showbread because he was a king. Now, when he ate the showbread, as, as one of my type ones uh, texted me in between services, they're like, he wasn't actually king yet when he ate the bread. <laughs> actually, he was, but nobody knew it. Yeah. And this is important for you to hear because the prophet knew it, and God knew it, and David knew it. <clears throat> but nobody else knew it. Just like nobody there knew that Jesus was king. And Jesus said, just like David ate the showbread... I get to eat whenever I want, yeah. <laughs> number one, right? And so as you remember, as we talk about uh, the, the Sanhedrin, there was a certain, you know, we look, at, we look at Judaism as if it's a monolith, as if there's one, like it is a thing, but Judaism is not a thing. There's many, many different flavors of Judaism. And unfortunately, uh, much of a whole section of it was destroyed at the fall of um, Jerusalem uh, around AD 69. And so we don't get as much as what the Sadducees taught. Uh, but but um, Judaism, there's many, many flavors. Even in America today, there's many flavors of Judaism. So it, we get trapped into thinking the Jews did this. That's like saying Christians do that. And you and I both know that's not true. They, they should be doing what we're doing, right? I mean, that's, you know, right? And so Judaism, was, is, is, is a, it's, there's a lot to it. But primarily in the day, there was the Jews who worshipped, they thought they were righteous because of the law, uh, who were the Pharisees. And then there was Jews who thought they were righteous because of the temple. Remember this? There were the, those, the Sadducees thought it was the temple was the center of Judaism. And the Pharisees taught that the law was the center of of Judaism. And so first, Jesus goes after the law, uh, talking about just like David ate the showbread and it wasn't a problem, right? Yeah, so, so me, king, can, can do this as well. And, and then he says in, in Matthew 12, where he also tells his story, he talks about the temple and he says, uh, there, there's one greater than the temple here right now. You worship this temple, but there is somebody greater than the temple. Well, that's something to, to, to say there. There's, there. there's something, right? And then in both of them, uh, and then, then, then both of them, he kind of drops this next bomb on them. In verse 8, he says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. 
So the Pharisee is saying, you're doing something that's not lawful. He's like, uh, actually, I am not under the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of your holy day. <laughs> like, how do you be Lord of a day? What does that even mean? But Jesus is operating on a different level. Amen? <laughs> what he's talking about is on another level. So he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And, you know, it's important, like I said, as we understand, what does it mean to be a follower of God? It's important that we wrestle with why Jesus came. These are questions that we have to answer. And we can get the evangelical, easy, patent answer. He came to make a way for man to be one with God. Yes, absolutely he did that. But if you think that's all he did, you are missing out. That's, that's not all he did. He didn't just come to abolish sin. Someone clap with Travis. He didn't just come to abolish sin. He came for lots of reasons. He brought the, came to bring the heaven to earth, right? He came, to, he came to abolish sin. He came to empower us. He came to release Holy Spirit, to give us a spirit, give so that we can have reassurance of our salvation, to have power, to minister, to have a communion with God. Uh, but he also came for another reason, which is all throughout the New Testament. He came to destroy religion. Jesus came to destroy the religion of the day. He is constantly rebuking the Pharisees, and you have to understand why he's doing that. He wasn't just mad at them. You might think, like, they're just keeping the law, and here's Jesus being mean to them. But were they actually keeping the law? You see, as we look at the Bible and what it means to keep the Sabbath, we only find four scriptures that tell us what that means. There's four scriptures. I don't have time to go through the actual scriptures, but you can look it up. I didn't invent this, right? Uh, number one thing that was forbidden on the Sabbath was you could not start a fire. You could not kindle a fire. Number two, you could not um, gather fuel. You can't go chop down trees on the Sabbath and, and, gar and um, gather firewood. Number three, you could not carry burdens Number four, you could not transact business. You couldn't be at work. So you couldn't start a fire, couldn't gather firewood, could not carry burdens, and you couldn't do business. Biblically, that's it. Biblically, that's it. By the time Jesus showed up on the scene, there were 39 laws that the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees had. There were 39 laws of things that you could not do on the Sabbath. And some of them were all encompassing. Some of them were so wide, they were open to interpretation. God had four, man had 39. Jesus came to bring a Sabbath, or the, God came to bring a Sabbath so that man would be forced to actually rest. Now, we kind of miss, we kind of miss the meaning of that in our day and age because when the scriptures were written, the Sabbath meant something entirely different. So back in the day, if you wanted to eat, you had to work. And if you're a farmer, you work from when before the sun rose until the sun went down. That's what you did. There was always work to do. And if you did not work, you would starve in the winter. And so it's easy to fall into a fear that I won't have enough. And so the entire time you're awake, you're working. And he's like, that's bad, right? That is not trusting God. And God's like, I want you to trust me. And in trusting me, you're going to set aside some time to rest, right? Now, today, we don't have the same burdens they had then. Does anybody like the weekend? Yeah. I like the weekend. Weekends, if you like a weekend, thank the unions. The unions came and they got us weekends in the early 1900s. Uh, I, I, I like the day we're living in. I'm not mad about it. There's a, there's, a, there's a movement that started about 15 years ago, probably a little bit earlier. That's when I was aware of it, of this uh, back to Jewish roots thing. It was all this Jew. You saw it everywhere, the flags. and We need the Jewish roots. And I'm like, uh, okay, back, what, what Jewish roots are we going back to? The ones that Jesus wanted to destroy? Because I don't want to go back to what Jesus came to destroy, right? I don't want to go back to the Judaism that Jesus came and hated, right? If we're going to get back to what God wanted, I'll go back to that. But I'm not looking to go back in time just to go back in time. Amen? I don't want to go back in time to when, you know, women weren't equal. I don't want to go back in time to when you could own other people. I don't want to go back in time to when children died from preventable diseases. I don't want to go back in time where 11-year-olds worked in factories 15 hours a day, 7 days a week. I don't want to go back in time. I'm liking where we're at now. Amen? 
I'm enjoying where we're at right now. And so, so there's this legalism about the Sabbath that comes into some churches sometimes where they say you got to sit somewhere for a full day or you're not following God. And, and that's not what the Sabbath is about. Like you, there should be times where you're not working. And the problem is we carry our job with us, many of us. Right? And so a Sabbath, you might be turned the stinking thing off. And trust God that you're not going to answer emails for the next seven hours and your business is not going to collapse around you. Or you actually, like, like the word said, where you had to gather some extra on the day before the Sabbath so you can Sabbath. You might need to put some processes in place so you could not be working on the day when you're going to be Sabbathing. Does that make sense? You might need to do a little extra work to set up some systems so you don't have to be on your phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Does that make sense? To some of you, the Sabbath means like, I am not going to look at social media on a certain day of the week. Nothing against social media, but for some of you, it's a job, which is weird, right? But that's between you and God, right? <laughs> now, I, 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 this isn't in my message, but I feel the need to say this. A job is something you get paid to do. If you're not getting paid, it's called a hobby. And if your hobby is running your life, you're in bondage. bondage. If you're living your life for likes on Instagram, it's time to wake up a little bit. Unless you're making money, then do that, right? But if you're not making money, like, what are we doing here? This hobby should not be running your life. So in Mark chapter 7, Jesus, he quotes Isaiah the prophet, and he says, gosh, this, I don't know, I'm going to blame my going so late on the worship team. It's all their fault, even though I've been up here way too long already. But I'm nowhere near done. Uh, so he quotes Isaiah the prophet. And, and can you imagine Jesus saying the prophet, when the prophet hundreds of years ago was rebuking people, he's really talking about you. Can you imagine? I don't know what that would feel like. He says, he says um, you people talk. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He's like, Isaiah talked about you guys. He said in Mark 7, he says, you, you people talk like you're followers of God, but there's no heart connection. Wow. He says, you put a God stamp on your man-made rules and your traditions. And then in verse 9, he says, You're experts in setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. That's religion. That's what religion does. We set aside God's true heart to keep tradition. And this is where doctrines like women can't preach come from. Yeah, that might be your tradition, but you've set aside the commandment of God where Jesus said there's neither male nor female. That he gave men and women authority in the garden. It's just... Paul called Priscilla an apostle, but you think that a woman can't actually read the Bible now. That's your tradition, and you set aside the commandment of God to keep it, right? So instead of following God, we follow what we know. That's what, it, that's what that means. And so as we grow in Christ, we have to actually examine what we're doing and saying, is God actually in this? Or did I just, was I just given a lens and I never questioned it? Right? Instead of living for God, they were living for religion. And let me say this, you were not created for rules, you were created for a relationship with God. This is why you were created, for a relationship with God. This is why you were created, for a relationship with God. So some of you, you remember that time when you first met him and it was like you were living in a God bubble, like the glory zone, like you were the glory zone and there were angels singing over you all the time. You remember this? And people got saved everywhere you went, you remember that? You remember that? You just talked about Jesus all the time, and there was an anointing on it, and there was a blessing, and you were just like, there was, like, where do you end, and where do I begin? Like, do people recognize? Am I transfigured right now? <laughs> do people see the glory on me, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, something, something happened. Something, something, something happened. <laughs> like, I was just going. I was just going along, me and Jesus. And then, then something happened. Like, I just, I've got this. Life is good, everybody. I know today it's just me and a Bible, and next year it's going to be 10,000. Oh, wait a minute. And then we wonder, like, what? what? And the problem is, some of you, like, you thought that tree was a wall. And you've never passed the tree. You're just stuck there. You're stuck there at this thing that you thought was all-encompassing, and it was just an obstacle that God wanted you to get around. And, and, and the problem is, if we don't examine 
we don't examine our relationship with God, if we don't examine where we're at in Christ, if we don't examine what we believe and why we believe it, we'll find ourselves with forces at work in our lives that will take us places we never wanted to go. It'll take us places we never wanted to go. And, 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 and we'll find ourselves under powers that God never intended us to be under. Stuck, stuck under the tree. Just stuck at the tree. Just stuck there. Thinking that I just can't get around this. Because we're trapped by a narrow theology. We're trapped by a narrow belief system. We're trapped like, God, I have to be doing this. And there's the tree. And that's, I've, that's it. That's all there is. Let me tell you what, what Paul said to Galatians who are trapped in the same legalistic worldview. In Galatians 4, 6, he said, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit, say Spirit, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, hear me, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You are no longer a slave. If you've put your faith in Christ Jesus, hear me, you are not a slave of that mindset that has held you back. Hear me, you're not a slave of that tree holding you back. That obstacle that came does not run your life. It does not rule over you. It does not have authority over you. You are not a slave. You are a son of the God who's willing to stand in a group of Pharisees and say, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. That is who you are. Amen. You're an heir of that God. That's who you are. And God is confirming that in this house recently with signs and wonders. We, um, we've had a, a, bit, a bit of a move happening. And I believe God is doing this in many, many facets in people's lives. I believe he's doing it financially. I believe he's doing it relationally. I believe he's doing it ministerially. But the Lord has confirmed it through mental health. He's decided to show us uh, through mental health that you are no longer a slave, but you actually have authority. Amen? You know, us not a slave, you're, not, you're an authority. Now, if you have authority, you have to exercise it. Yeah. doesn't matter if you have all the authority in the world if you stay home in your bed. It doesn't mean you're not getting a job. It's just not going to happen. Quit praying, go get a job. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you feel called, if you feel God is calling you, you might need to actually pray and read your Bible. You might need to actually skip some meals. You might need to actually, oh, here's a weird one, go to church regularly. You might actually want to contribute financially. You might actually want to be part of the body, right? Like there's a reaction that we have to do at God's wooing. But right now in this season, God is doing something significant in our midst. And um, I've talked about it and the Lord convicted me that I didn't tell you the whole story. And so I'm going to kind of tell you the whole story today and hopefully you'll be happy about it and then God will touch you. Amen. So two Friday nights ago, not two days ago, Friday night, but nine days ago at the burning room. Um, we shared, and I talked a little about this last week, we shared a, a prophetic word that three leaders got uh, that week, and uh, unbeknownst, we didn't coordinate it, we didn't know that we each had it, uh, I had just asked two people, do you have a word, I asked one person, do you have a word, yes, okay, and then I asked one in the middle of the worship, do you have a word, yes, okay, good, uh, and, and I had a word, and so Sarah Pagano got a word out of Psalm 54, 4, uh, it was, behold, God is my helper, the Lord is the, here's the important part, sustainer of my soul. And so if the Lord is the sustainer of my soul, then my soul is not a slave to my feelings. My soul is not a slave to my circumstances. My soul is not a slave to the enemy, not even a slave to uh, any chemical imbalances I have. And what that means is I uh, actually have a choice. And, and the word that came forth is um, uh, don't turn a season into a lifestyle. And since the Lord is the sustainer of the soul, I get to choose to come out of the season, out of this, out of the season, and, and live in a lifestyle of overcoming, yeah. right? And that would have been a good word in and of itself. But then Kellyanne had a word that she had also gotten that week, and the Lord said to her, uh, uh, "Don't play with fire, or you might get burned. But if you go through the fire, you'll be purified, right?" And so that's a good word right there. If you play with fire, you'll be burned. Uh, but if you go through the fire, You'll come out like gold, I think is what it was, or something like that. Pretty close. Uh, and so what that word was saying was, uh, and she expounded on how God was talking, if you allow lies to linger in your brain, eventually you're going to get burned. If you allow yourself to stay in, in caustic mindsets, if you allow yourself to stay in unhealthy uh, meditations, if you allow yourself to meditate on sin, if you don't take control of your mind, you will be burned. You can't just let your mind do whatever it wants to do and come out like gold. You actually have to withstand it. And if God is telling you you have to withstand it, that means that he's giving you the power to withstand it. 
He'll never call you to do something he won't power you to do. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> and the Lord told me um, at the same time on uh, Thursday morning, uh, I woke up and he basically told me that if you can see the breakthrough, you can have it now. So if you have faith, if you know the breakthrough is coming, you can just receive it right now. And so I had gone through a great deal of what I'll call warfare, but really the crazies tried to attack me on Wednesday, which is my day off, and which is not when you want to be crazy. You want to be crazy at work. If you want to, just, if you want to ruin a day, if you, want to, if you want a day to not be productive, you don't want it to be your day off. You want it to be your work day when someone's paying you, right? Like, but it's on my, it's on my day off. <clears throat> I said that out loud, right? <clears throat> and so... I woke up Thursday morning and I saw the breakthrough and the Lord's like, well, I'll we'll just have it right now. And I was like, well, if I can see it, then I can just have it right now. And then I was, then I was done. I was like, I just came through. Well, hallelujah. There's something in this, I think. And so we each three had this word. So this was on last Friday night. Now, here's the part I didn't tell you about. <clears throat> um, you may have heard the story. The Lord will, now some of y'all, you're about, I'm about to lose you, right? But just, it is what it is, right? God, God is God, right? And, he, and God does things how he wants to do things. So several years ago, <clears throat> I was in prayer, and the Lord said to me, watch the winner of the Preakness. And I was going through a very significant spiritual season, um, and the Lord had done something very, very significant, but it wasn't done yet, and I didn't understand why it wasn't done. And you know, I wasn't even praying about that, that, but the Lord said, look at the winner of the Preakness. And I knew the Preakness is a horse race, but I don't follow horse racing. Um, and I, so I was like, oh, well, that's a weird word to get. When's the Preakness? And it turned out to be the Preakness was the next day. I'm like, God might be in this. And so the winner of the Preakness was literally like when I saw the winner, the Lord spoke to me, the season came to an end, I got supernatural impartation, and all kinds of amazing things happened. And I don't have time to tell that entire story. I told it at the burning room. But just it's important for you to understand that the Lord sometimes will speak to me through the winner of the Preakness. Now, I've tried to watch other horse races to get a word, and it hasn't worked. <clears throat> We had the Kentucky Derby recently, and there was a winner. I was like, oh, that's the winner. And then he got disqualified. I was like, well, maybe the disqualification of the And God's like, just stop this nonsense. I didn't tell you to look at that at all. <clears throat> He's like, I, this is, I ain't in none of this. I was like, okay, I got you. I was like, this could be a good message. And he's like, no, no, that's stupid. Don't do that. <clears throat> so last Friday night, <clears throat> we had these, these and, and I woke up Saturday morning, and something had shifted in me. Something happened spiritually that night. And again, this last Friday, I woke up Saturday morning. I was like, whoa, this is something, something, something has happened. And uh, Stephanie spoke about what happened this, this Friday night. But so last Friday night, uh, I knew something significant had happened. And I woke up uh, uh, Saturday morning, and I started reading the news. And the news was like, the Preakness is today. I'm like, God is setting me up for something good, right? And so we're in this season where God is basically saying, listen, I, I, I am giving you authority in your will. I'm giving you will power. Right? Where you feel like your will is the slave of your emotions or your will is the slave of your circumstances or you're, you don't have willpower or your will somehow is dictated by your, your season. Or, does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Where you feel like you don't have authority over what's going on in your heart and your mind. We felt like God was giving authority to people in their will. And then the next day was the Preakness. And let me tell you who the winner of the Preakness was. The winner of the Preakness was the war of will. God is giving victory in the war of will. <clears throat> now, that's just weird. I don't, I, don't, I don't get that. But God, amen? amen. I feel like the, the owner owes me money. That's just how I feel. I just feel like I should get a cut of the purse because the Lord was trying to send some. I just feel like. But listen, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. The next day, the winner of the Preakness that the Lord speaks me through was the war of the will. The Lord is giving authority in the war of will. This is, and God, God, God told us. Peter, Peter spoke it. The Lord spoke through Peter in the day of Pentecost. He's like, I will grant signs and wonders, right? Wonders in the sky and signs on the earth. And, and this, this is a sign. This is a sign. This, this, kind of, this is kind of the weird ways God talks to me. And I, I just, I don't. I, you can talk however you want, God. Morse code, I'll learn Morse code. You want to send me, I'll read the Bible. I'll read skywriting, whatever you want. You want to send a bird, an angel, the winner of the Preakness. That takes faith. Amen. That takes faith. But the, the goal that I want you to see here is, number one, God could talk to you through all kind of amazing ways. Yeah. 
But you need some covering. You need some people to tell you whether or not that's God or that's just foolishness, right? Amen. Now, you'll graduate to a place where you'll know his voice. And only on the big ones you'll have to say, hey, I'm feeling this. Let's bring in some people to have a conversation whether or not this is God, right? Like, what I don't want you to do, and, and I, I feel silly almost telling you this, I don't want you to look at your clock and start getting prophetic words from the time every hour, right? Like, this is not what I want. If, you've, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're blessed. But I had somebody I discipled, and he was like, I probably shouldn't tell that story. But <clears throat> I once knew somebody. And they were obsessed with someone. And every time 11 came up on the digital clock, they felt like it was confirmation. I was like, this has nothing to do with that. They don't actually like you. It's not going to happen. It's not, and it, it didn't, right? It didn't happen. Like, I don't want you to leave here with weird prophetic stuff happening that doesn't have any meaning, right? You need to have somebody say, no, that's, no, that's just a pizza that fell on the ground. There's no prophetic sign in that at all. That's, that's all that is. No, your eviction isn't prophetic. You didn't pay rent. That's how that works. Right? But he does speak. That doesn't take away the point that he, that he does speak. And so the question you have now, we have to answer is, okay, what do we do with this information? Our pastor, what God spoke to him through, and you can't even tell your friends about this because you're like, I don't even know how I would tell them. How was church? It was awesome. There was the preakness in the winter and God and my pastor should get some money. Like, I don't, right? Like, how do you explain that? I, you know, <clears throat> but there are things in the natural that explain what happens in the spirit, right? Like there's, there's like similar laws at work. So what do you do with this information? <clears throat> it's not something just for me. Number one, I want you to see, number one, that God will speak to us in supernatural ways. But number two, there, there, is, a, there is a victory in the war of the will that I want you to receive in this season and not only receive, but to give away. Okay, in, in the natural, there's Newton's laws of inertia, right? You've heard of this. You've, you know, they, and some people call it the laws of motion. Uh, whatever's at rest will stay at rest. Whatever's in motion will stay in motion unless something slows it down, like the tree, right? Like the tree is an object of inertia, right? And so, so I, I, have a, I have a little, ob, I have a little, so, so, so this is many of your lives right here. This is many of our lives. Like nothing is happening. As much as we want something to happen, Nothing is going to happen there. You can look at that all week, and it's not going to move. Amen? And many of you feel like, that's me. I'm like the middle silver ball there, and nothing is happening. I'm not getting where I feel called to be. I'm not any closer to the breakthrough. I keep hitting the tree. The tree is not moving. I do not understand why I'm stuck in this place. You see, as long as no, that stays like that, nothing's going to happen. But what has to happen is some energy needs to be introduced into the equation. Energy has to be introduced into the equation in order for there to be change. And here's what I want to let you know. Holy Spirit is the change agent that Jesus sent to bring some inertia in our lives and get things moving. So next slide. So Holy Spirit comes, and he's ready to rock your boat right now, right? It's not like we need to get Holy Spirit worked up and get him deciding to change things. No, that is how he always is in our life. And all we need to do is we need to just kind of turn, we need to kind of turn and look to him and say, come, I'm ready. I'm ready for it right now. Jesus sent the Holy Ghost to be that change agent, and he's got that thing ready to swing into your life and make some changes happen. Can you hear what I'm saying? And we felt this coming, and that's why we came up with, this is what we're looking for in this season, more of God's presence. More of God's presence. Put that slide up for me, please. We want more of God's presence. We want to be more intentional with God. And we want to be more radical for Jesus. This is, this is what God is enabling you to do in this season so you can achieve what he has for you. We want, to be, we want more closeness to God, more close to his presence. We more, do you hear what I'm saying? This is what we want. And we're crying out for this. We're crying out to be more intentional. Like, I'm not just waiting for God to come and wreck my life. I'm actually leaning into it. I'm showing up at the burning room maybe, or I'm, I'm beginning to witness to people. I'm, 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 I'm reading my Bible, and I'm expecting things, and I'm, I'm leaning in. I'm getting more, maybe you just need to get more radical for Jesus. What does it look like in your life to get more radical? Probably praying for the sick, right? Telling people about church, telling people about what God's doing in your life, maybe sharing some of your revelation. We just want to get more radical for Jesus. And this is what Peter talked about on the day of Pentecost. I'm going to close with this. They were, they were at this same place, and they were asking, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do with what you're telling us? 
Like the people that weren't getting rocked by the Holy Ghost were asking, what do we do? What do we do with what you're telling us? And Peter stood up in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. He says, listen, here's what you do. And this is for all of us. Repent. Change your mind. Decide, I want change. I'm going to turn from what's going on in my life, but I'm going to turn to God. Repent and return. And this is what I believe many of you are going to receive in this season. So that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is what your heart desires. This is what your soul longs for. This is what your spirit was created for. Times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Stand with me if you would. See, here's what I want you to know. Jesus steps into dysfunction and starts a party. This is who he is. He steps into your dysfunction and starts a party. He doesn't say, you need to get this worked out. Jesus is like, I'm ready to start a party right here in your place of mourning. I'm ready to start a party right here in your place of mourning. Come on. One class, we all class. Come on. If I'm here to start a party in your place of mourning. This is who Jesus is. But we need to hunger and thirst for his presence. Because if we don't, something else will fill that void. There's an enemy planting trees in your little bike path. And we need to hunger and thirst for his presence. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So many in this house, I believe, need that rest that only comes from God. You don't need a law. You don't need legalism. You need the rest of God. I will give you rest rest. Jesus says, take my yoke. He's like, get rid of that religious thing and the sin thing. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Can you say amen? We're going to sing just one verse here real quick, or a bridge, or I don't even know what it's called. I'm not on the worship team, but they know what they're singing. I'm believing this is going to happen in some of your lives. But I believe that some of you need like someone to start the ball swinging for you. And so I just want to lay hands on some people who just need that started in your life. So we're going to begin singing and you, I just want to welcome you to come down and just line up and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm just going to, I just want to touch some people. And I believe what's happening can get kick started in your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing and uh, if you just wait a minute before you leave, because I think the Holy Spirit's going to do something. And uh, Corey will come up and dismiss you in just, just a minute. But just allow Holy Spirit to move in our midst. So we say, Holy Spirit, would you please come? Ha. Yeah. Come, Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Ghost, and begin to move. And if you feel like you just need me to touch you to get this thing started, I welcome you to come forward, and the ushers will line you up. That is who you are. somebody to, like Pastor was talking about, just get things kick-started a little bit. Amen? Thank you guys so much for coming today. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Say hello to somebody you don't know on your way out. We love you so much. Have an amazing Sunday. Go be the church and we'll see you next week. Amen? God bless you guys.